morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Let me welcome you to this session on decision making for COVID response using data intelligence system. We are currently at Bern, Switzerland, at the United Nations World Development Forum. And I, on behalf of the organizers, Deba Priya Bhattacharya from Center for Policy Dialogue, Bangladesh, welcome, welcoming you heartily to this session. Thank you for joining. As you can see that I have the panelists with me over here. Also, some of the panelists uh, will be joining virtually. Uh, as you know, the, 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 the pandemic has definitely profoundly changed the data landscape. Many countries have been up and doing in not only innovating new processes, but also strengthening the traditional areas of data collection. Uh, there had been data used both for the management of the uh, procurement, management and procurement of the vaccines, uh, their, their rollout, and also in terms of identification of the priority communities and the, uh, the population cohorts. At the same time, there had been post-vaccination surveillance going around. Many countries have, strong, have invested very strongly in this area, in the health sector in particular. There are now challenges. How do you take these efforts forward? How do you really make them more inclusive? How do you put in more transparency? How do you really have more both horizontal and vertical integration with other data and intelligence system? And last and not, not the least, how do you make more evidence-based policy making in the future? These are some of the issues we are going to put forward today. And I wanted to remind you that this session is being organized jointly by seven organizations. Uh, the lead is taken by the A2I in uh, Asp Aspire to Innovate, a platform, a whole of the government approach platform which is dedicated to digital transformation of the Bangladesh government. Along with that, is, there is the cabinet division of the government, the IC information and communication technology division of the government. Uh, there is the director general of the health services of the Bangladesh government and UNDP, uh, the South-South Network for Public uh, Service Innovation, and my organization, Center for Policy Dialogue, a think tank. So, and I will be introducing the, the speakers, the panelists. We have a great set of speakers today coming from different sectors and also with diverse uh, qualification and also exp immense experience in the data field. So colleagues, let me start off by inviting Anir Chaudhary, the policy advisor of A2I. As I have mentioned, it is an unique flagship program of the government of Bangladesh to start off uh, this discussion, to kick off this discussion. A2I had been in the driving seat in innovating data, uh, not only for the COVID response, but also for providing support, uh, the data support to various ministries of the government, and also trying to inculcate the culture of uh, evidence-based policy making. So let me in, in, invite Anir to start your presentation. I understand you have a PowerPoint. Huh? Yes. Please, go ahead. You have your 10 minutes. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, moderator, uh, Dr. Devapriya Bhattacharya, uh, distinguished panelists, uh, audience uh, in, on, in the room, not too many, but an audience uh, across the world uh, online. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening. Could I have the slides, please? Thank you. I'll talk about uh, data during disaster. Obviously, COVID was a disaster uh, that we had to all uh, live through, uh, address the challenges, and thrive at the same time during the last 18 months plus now. But I'll talk about uh, challenges that happened uh, beyond COVID as well, uh, during COVID. So we had natural disasters that we also had to contend with. So I'll talk about how data was used uh, to address COVID issues and also other challenges that we had to deal with during that time. But let me first start with uh, data during peacetime. So what we had done in Bangladesh is uh, we introduced a platform called SDG Tracker, uh, which is a whole of government platform where data comes in from about uh, 80 different agencies to provide updates and planning 
uh, and progress tracking uh, on specific indicators on SDGs, the uh, 200 plus indicators that we are tracking uh, for the last few years. Uh, at the same time, we took SDG tracker to the parliamentarians in a platform called My Constituency. So the 300 parliamentarians that we have uh, look at SDG by constituency and can actually plan uh, for the constituency, uh, compete with each other, and also compete with themselves uh, with the past years. We also, uh, with the help of UNDESA, have been working on an open government data platform where data from 50 different agencies are coming in. But now let's talk about the disaster time. So that was the peace time when we had all these different uh, whole of government platforms. When disaster came, we actually realized that the data that government had was not enough. We actually had to go to private sector to look at data they have. But what was really happening? Policymakers uh, make decisions based on data, but sometimes the statisticians, especially our NSO, the National Statistics Office Bureau of uh, Statistics in Bangladesh, uh, present data which policymakers don't always understand. So the concept of dashboards, which uh, potentially would be very useful for policymaking, uh, and this is, a, this is a dashboard from a car, uh, 52 different types of things happening in a car in terms of mileage, uh, oil change, and all those things that are coming that the driver uses uh, to make decisions real time as he's driving the car. However, our policymakers don't drive cars. They sit in the passenger seat. So they don't always look at the dashboards. So that paradigm actually changed with real time uh, data during COVID. And that understanding that mindset actually changed quite a bit. So the policymakers started looking at dashboards and started telling the driver uh, that this is what we need to have, this is how we need to visualize things, and this is how we make decisions. So COVID, in a very interesting way, as calamitous as it was, uh, made sure that policymakers were much more mindful of data, much more aware of data, and much more sensitive to how data was being used for policymaking. So what we saw is that cross-agency and public-private partnership emerged in a very big way. So collection of different types of data from private sector, public sector came together, and big data was being used. And I'll talk about some of those uh, examples. The first, obviously, was supporting vital health decisions. So we needed to first identify high-risk cases. We had only one RT-PCR lab, and Professor Flora is with us. She was leading uh, that lab, and she was uh, uh, presenting every single day the, the deaths and the disease progression and making recommendations on, on public TV. So we needed to actually support her, her organization, the Epidemiology Institute, uh, to make the right decisions for the entire government. Uh, we also looked at uh, prediction of disease progression, hot zone identification, and since we only had one RT-PCR lab at that time, uh, now we have quite a few across the entire country. Uh, so with one lab, when the pandemic started last year during the March-April timeframe, uh, we were looking at data from telcos. So we repurposed our uh, national hotline, uh, 333. So hundreds of thousands of people were calling in to report their symptoms. We had an IVR system where they could report symptoms, and we used artificial intelligence and machine learning to identify where the disease was progressing the fastest. Based on that, we did resource allocation. Uh, we also used uh, data to uh, uh, identify vaccine recipients, uh, timely policy response, and then non-health policy response also came to this. So let me show you uh, a picture of that uh, COVID-19 collective intelligence system, as we call it. Uh, so data from different sources, so telehealth systems that we had, multiple telehealth systems, hospitals, uh, all the diagnostic labs, we obviously had a lot more labs, over uh, 100 plus labs uh, over time. Uh, frontline workers, they were, they were uh, sending in reports. Uh, vaccination data came in later on when we started vaccination earlier this year. And uh, community support teams, primarily driven by both our uh, Director General of Health Services and also several large NGOs like BRAC, they worked on together to provide community support. And a lot of non-health data also came in. So all this data came together in, in, in systems with interoperability. 
so that we could make important decisions. A lot of analytics engines were developed uh, and the telehealth service was also improved. So the national helpline, as I mentioned, triple three, became the largest telemedicine service over time, uh, within a matter of weeks. We had about 4,500 doctors. Uh, we call them Uber doctors because they would call in like Uber drivers uh, for maybe two hours a day, five hours a day, whenever they had time, and they provide telemedicine services uh, to general people. And then dashboards emerged, different types of dashboards. There is medical dashboards, there are administrative dashboards, and there are public dashboards. Corona.gov.bd became the information dissemination for a large number of uh, people, uh, populations. So every day we had tens of thousands of people visiting this website, and we tried to uh, combat misinformation with this website. So all this data from many different sources, public, private, came into the analytics engines uh, within the DG Health, the Director General of Health Services, and provided decisions for health administrators, policymakers, non-health administrators, and also public. Uh, this is an example of uh, the COVID-19 national dashboard, which I'm sure uh, Dr. Flora will talk more about. Uh, this became a very important decision-making tool. Uh, where we looked at uh, risk maps, where we looked at uh, case positivity, we looked at uh, number of uh, uh, people affected, number of people dead by district, uh, hospitalization, uh, vaccination issues, uh, oxygen, all, all sorts of things. Uh, which hospitals are getting uh, booked up and how many seats are empty. So all these information actually would come into the national dashboard. There's a a team every week uh, that would sit uh, uh, with leadership of Dr. Flora and we would make decisions and recommendations to the entire government based on this uh, COVID-19 uh, national dashboard. Uh, this is an example of how in specific city corporations uh, where the population density is the largest, uh, so looking at the city corporations by ward, wards are the small uh, zones within city and we were trying to look at where the disease was moving the fastest. Uh, this is basically a four-week view, the last four weeks, how the disease has progressed there. So this was extremely helpful in, in order to make uh, health decisions and non-health administrative decisions as well. Uh, this is an example of uh, how we looked at hospital. So hospital occupancy uh, by district and by hospital. So this is where we are seeing, let's say, 66% occupancy in a district called Borisal. And Maiman Singh is 111%, so basically it's overflowing with, with patients. So we even had decisions about whether to divert patients from one hospital to another. Uh, this is an example of how PCR data was compared with telehealth. We uh, developed a telehealth service. We had several, I talked about the Uber telehealth, but there was another one that was created specifically for COVID patients. So uh, patients should be followed up for two weeks since they were detected with PCR uh, test data. So PCR test data would come into the telehealth service and doctors would call into the patient's numbers. And since the, uh, the identification was done by phone numbers, so we were able to reach all the patients. I'll, I'll, I'll try to uh, wrap up very quickly. Uh, this is a proportion of COVID patients by comorbidity status. Uh, we also had, we introduced a mass distribution hub. So this is another dashboard where uh, a lot of NGOs and government and private sector organizations were distributing masks free of charge to, to population because that was another very, very important in, in addition to vaccination. Vaccination came later, obviously. Uh, this was a very important health uh, intervention that we had. And we were actually tracking mask distribution and mask usage in different districts. Uh, this is a rapid mortality surveillance that was conducted by uh, Vital Strategies uh, and a couple of other organizations like ICDDRB. Uh, and we looked at how the cause of death was actually changing. And uh, uh, Dr. Abuzar, Karl Abuzar, will actually talk about some of these things, how the mortality information was shifting. So you will see in the Q2 and Q3 of 2020, uh, pneumonia became the highest cause of uh, death uh, replacing heart disease, which was very interesting. This is how uh, vaccine information was being tracked. Uh, and let me talk a little bit about beyond COVID. I'll take just one minute to finish up. Uh, uh, this is where we, we are seeing uh, impact on other socioeconomic uh, status. So this is uh, education impact. So our schools were closed for 18 months. I just stretched probably we topped the list of countries and how it was actually impacting 
So we de developed this uh, in cold collaboration with UNICEF. Uh, this is looking into the future. Uh, example from Togo, uh, how poverty ranking is being developed in Bangladesh as an experiment, and we'll be working with the, our NSO uh, on this as well. So how telephone usage, uh, uh, cell phone usage, is being used to proxy poverty indication. So this is going to be a breakthrough if we can prove this in Bangladesh in terms of targeting uh, population for social safety net. So this is a dynamic social safety net that we can actually develop over time because we can depend on more than just surveys to identify poverty. This is, uh, we also, during, uh, during the COVID time period, we also had natural disasters like cyclones and floods. We worked with Google to improve our flood forecasting system. So this is an example of that, working with the Ministry of Water Resources and Water Development Board. Uh, data from uh, last decades actually were put into the uh, Google's uh, machine learning uh, platform and now we can do better forecasting. But what we're now exploring is the possibility of preemptive social safety net before the event happens. Since we know that floods are coming in five days and who it will affect based on geospatial planning, uh, we can now say who will be affected and actually we can provide food and cash support to them and that shows uh, FCDO in UK actually has done a study where, we, where such some uh, preemptive uh, uh, support is actually very useful. This is an example of how 43 member countries are working on the South South Network who is an organizer of this event. Uh, South South Network for Public Service Innovation, we're looking at data and other innovations uh, to improve service delivery. And my last slide is uh, seven things that we have identified which are crucial. First is breaking data silos, as I talked about, silos within government and with private sector needs to be broken, and we have proven that that really helps policy making. Uh, incorporation of geospatial capacity in our NSO, that's very, very important. Uh, embracing big data, so data that is not com coming through surveys, but from administrative systems, and user-generated systems, such as social media, telcos, and all of that. Uh, developing intelligent analytics, I've given you several examples of that, how visualization is very important for policymakers, so that's important. Uh, building public, private, and academic partnerships. We work with a lot of academicians around the world, uh, uh, universities from the US and UK, to develop these uh, what we call data collectives. Uh, privacy protection is a very important area because we're dealing with a lot of sensitive data, especially from telcos and from health systems, and we need to make uh, certain that privacy is not uh, broken, and uh, promotion of South-South cooperation because we're actually learning from many different countries. I talked about India, talked about Togo, talked about many other countries where we learn from, and ho hopefully Bangladesh can also share its own experience with other countries. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Anir. Um, um, I'm sorry for uh, pushing you a bit, but I do know, understand that in the morning it takes time to keep up, pick up the momentum. But breaking up the silos to South-South cooperation, it's a wide subject to deal with. But thank you. I think that was quite uh, instructive, the Bangladesh experience, and also it touched upon other forms of collaboration beyond the border. So we, we, we have heard how the collection was done from different sources. We have seen how the analysis were undertaken in this case, and then how it was fed into the decision-making process. We have also heard how the public engagement took place in these cases, and the partnerships which were forged in the process. And, and last but not the least, the issue was not limited to the uh, dealing with the pandemic, but also looking for preemptive solutions as well as post-pandemic recovery in certain ways. So thank you. It was a wide subject, and I'm pretty sure my eminent panelists in person present here and also virtually out there will be able to further elucidate some of this matter. Now let me come to the panelists over here. I have uh, with me Dr. Alex uh, peterson Zwane. Uh, she has two, more than 20 years of experience in this area. She is a social innovator herself. She had been uh, engaged in the evidence-based policy making. She had been there in the international development cooperation in many ways, she had been recognized as a global leader, as a young leader in these issues. She, ha she has her background both in statistics and also in public health and, and political science. Uh, she currently leads the Global Innovation Fund. As you may know, Global Innovation Fund is an unique organization which in is involved in uh, providing both grant, debt, and equity support to various kinds of activities, including 
innovative data solutions. So we are very, very pleased to have uh, uh, <coughs> Dr. Alex with us, uh, Dr. Alex Peterson Zwane. And my issue to you, uh, Dr. Peterson Zwane, is that we have heard about the COVID response. But I think people are now getting ready how to jump into the recovery process and how we were going to really re go back to the new normal, as they say. So what role do you see for data in these cases? And what type of international collaboration can really strengthen the national level initiative in these cases? Please, Ms. Oh, <clears throat> well, thank you so much. And Amir, thank you for that uh, excellent uh, presentation and Dr. Fartijaya for including me in this conversation. I think there's two points I'd like to make from the perspective of the Global Innovation Fund, um, which is our mission is to accelerate innovation for international development, and we are backed by major donor aid agencies, such as USAID, FCDO in the UK, Sweden, and Australia, amongst, and Canada, amongst others. I really am in the, when we think about recovery and post-pandemic, I think it's very important for those of us who are in the international development cooperation side of things to think about how we can be productive partners. And there's a couple of points on that that I would make. The first is to accelerate the localization agenda and really challenge ourselves to make sure that precious and scarce ODA resources make it out of the OECD countries and into the countries where we're actually supposed to do that work. It remains, frankly, rather shocking how much of ODA money continues to actually be spent in OECD countries rather than in the places where um, poor, the poorest amongst us continue to live. So localization, being led by local priorities. And the second thing I would emphasize is working with, not around, government. I mean, the whole presentation that we heard today is precisely about the power of a whole of government effort in Bangladesh to respond to the pandemic. And it really behooves us who are on the development cooperation side of the table to think about supporting and strengthening um, efforts like A2I's work rather than working around government as sometimes has been done in the past. And then the third thing I would say is to double down on giving the space for experimentation and innovation. Taking risk is hard. Taking risk within government is really hard. And so to the extent that you can give breathing room or air cover for people to take risks can really um, result in some real breakthroughs. I'll give you one example from how we are supporting recovery at uh, GIF. We've partnered with the nonprofit called PASS to expand their ability to support environmental surveillance. You know, in developed countries in particular, we understand pretty well how to use wastewater sampling for early detection of uh, pathogens. But in contexts where there's fecal sludge as opposed to wastewater, we don't have that science as well developed. So we're supporting PATH to work in Malawi, Pakistan, Nepal, and Indonesia to improve our ability to detect COVID outbreaks in fecal sludge. And this, imagine how this stuff combined with the dynamic social safety net example that we heard about in the earlier uh, presentation could really be quite powerful, that you know an outbreak is happening because you see it in environmental surveillance data, and you're able to respond in a dynamic way to help out people who are going to be most affected. I think that's the kind of thing that gets me excited about the power of data as we go forward in a sort of post-vaccine phase of the COVID pandemic. Thank you very much, thank you very much. I, I think your first three messages are quite loud and powerful, that about localization, about whole of government approach, and also experimentation. So, uh, so you're ready to fail in terms of experimentation? <laughs> you know, I think we have to be able to fail sometimes. And, you know, just speaking again from the donor community, part of what's the appeal of an entity like the Global Innovation Fund is that it pools donor resources together and that actually provides some cover for those governments for the potential for failure. Yep. Only a portion of their resources are at risk in any particular innovation that we fund. 
So we really do try to be a learning organization. Not every investment we make pays off, and we try and be transparent about that. Thank you. Thank you for being candid on that. <laughs> Thank you. Colleagues, uh, uh, friends, uh, and participants, I'm going to move on to my next panelist. I have a person who had been on the hot seat for during the whole pandemic period. I think fending all the <coughs> questions and sharing all the information and providing all the good guidance to the, both to the public and to the government. Dr. Uh, Mirza Di Sabrina Flora, she is the additional director general at the governments of Bangladesh Health Service, uh, and she had been the public face for the government on media during this pandemic period. She has the most hands-on experience on how to use data for decision making in during the pandemic period. Dr. Flora, the floor is yours. I know the time is not enough for you, but please. No, thank you very much. Uh, actually, Dr. Mr. Ani Chaudhuri has set the background already, so I don't need to repeat many things. But um, if I want to respond in the use of data perspective, because for the last couple of days we are focusing on the discussion on data generation and data management. But uh, because of my uh, perspective, uh, we need to focus on the data utilization perspective also. And uh, therefore, if I want to respond in three phases, like the pre-pandemic phase, uh, although a lot of data were generated uh, through our uh, DHIS2 system, like the, our regular management information system, uh, surveillance data, and also different kind of survey and research data. But uh, I think a country like Bangladesh, we lack the policy to use data for the policy action. So that is one of the area where we need to work. We did use data, but I don't think it was as much as it was needed. Therefore, that was an area where we need to work further. Uh, and in, at, at, at this point in time, we face this pandemic. So we are not totally prepared to use data, but at the same time, during this pandemic, we had to. Okay. So with that perspective, during the pandemic, um, Mr. Chaudhary already mentioned about different sources of data, but from health perspective, we used to collect different data, even those who were incoming from different countries at that period. So we had to collect point of entry data also for the screening data and followed them up, those, patients, those persons, uh, for surveillance purpose to f detect the first case. And then when the case, we had community transmission, then we had to collect different kind of other data, what uh, Mr. Chaudhary mentioned, um, like laboratory data, hospital data, uh, telehealth data, and in addition to that, the for contact tracing and also uh, the, those who are uh, having uh, quarantine, what is happening to them. So this kind of data were being collected at that time. And because of the necessity, we had to start to use the data uh, because of this uh, limited resource and also time sensitivity of the action to be taken during this pandemic. We started to use data for our planning purpose and also the, to some extent the policy purpose. We had to prioritize the activity, had to prioritize the geographical zone where we can actually uh, have our containment activity. We had to uh, analyze the data for our hospital preparation in terms of how many hospital beds are required, how many ICU beds are required, what would be the requirement for oxygen, these kind of issues we had to. Even uh, as uh, Dr. Chaudhary has mentioned, in some hospitals, the hosp bed occupancy was more than 100%. So at that time, we had to decide about uh, development of field hospital. So in these ways, we usually uh, focused on using data. And uh, not only in managing the patient, uh, to some extent for containment and mitigation of the pandemic. We had to focus on that. Uh, now we are at, uh, at the phase of kind of phasing out of the infection because of uh, vaccine so, and also other public health measures we are following. So because of vaccine, again, we had to use our different kinds of data. Mm. But in future, if I focus on the post-pandemic period, uh, Health is an issue which is linked with many of the social determinants. So therefore, not only focusing on, on the health data, I think we need to work on other social determinants data also, which would be uh, useful in planning for health uh, post 
pandemic concern about the mental health, the economic concern, the social issues has been raised during this pandemic. And there would be required uh, integration of health as well as non-health data would be required. And, the, and the, in that perspective, so I understand that we should have strong coordination mechanism among all the partners and as, as well as interoperability of the data system so that as person of Ministry of Health, we can use those data. And in that perspective, I think uh, the whole of the government approach, what is mentioned by Alex and also uh, as shown by Dr. Chaudhary, uh, we need to go for whole of the society approach also, mm -hmm. which is very much linked with our SDG principle. So I would stop here, but yes. if we have anything no, uh, more else, I, I can, I don't no, know. I, I, I know, I wish I could give you more time, but I do have uh, two more very eminent uh, panelists who are in the pipeline, we'll do that, come to that. But I, I love the way you have described it, the pre-pandemic period, the pandemic period, and the post-pandemic recovery. And uh, in the pre-pandemic period, you have highlighted that the app, in the absence of a policy, you have really still used it, the data in that sense. So the policy will be an important part in the future, possibly. On the, on the pre pandemic part, you have said that, uh, I would say that necessity is the mother of innovation, if not invention. <laughs> so that was the way you have worked in that way. And then you have linked it in the recovery phase on that. My one question to you, suppose we have a third phase now, God forbid, if there is one. So the issue is, what would be a major lesson for the third or the next phase, if at all, from the all these three phases you have seen? How, what you do differently? Actually, uh, we learned by doing. Mm -hmm. This is the reality. Uh, nobody knows about the pandemic, how to deal with the pandemic. Yeah. So uh, through this process, we have learned about how to respond. And also we have uh, upgraded our hospitals. So in that perspective, I think we are better prepared. But again, there is always, in, during pandemic, there is a lot of uncertainty. So we have to be very much careful about the uncertain issues may come up, including the type of variant or what kind of uh, uh, pandemic, what kind of third wave it could yeah. be, specifically on the perspective of when we have our vaccine available, but at the same time, uh, whether these variants would be uh, important linked to will have important link with this vaccine coverage or not. Those issues yeah. could be uh, I, I, thought about. I, I hope you'll all agree that the data will play an important part over Definitely. here. Definitely. In terms of the <coughs> forecasting and also Definitely. having a better idea about what may come around in that we may not know fully, but we will be able to anticipate some of the things over there. And with that... Uh, so just it, one point yes, uh, regarding that um, for prediction purpose, the data used. Uh, as you have mentioned. Actually, uh, we have our surveillance system and it's better uh, nowadays in, uh, than the previous period. But I think as well as, as she has mentioned about the experiments and, and innovations issues, I think we need to go for some ad hoc basis data also, which might help us yes. in predicting the uh, future uh, direction of this pandemic. This will be a session in the next U UN World Data Forum. <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty sure about that. <laughs> but let me come to uh, Ms. Carla Abuzar. Uh, she had been an independent consultant, had been in this area for a long, long time, and she is a very experienced hand in this case. Uh, she is a public health specialist, she is a data person in that way. She had been with Gavi, with WHO, and many other organizations. I think the perfect person to reflect on these issues which we have just heard. So, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Ms. Carla, uh, what are the issue, what I have in mind for you is that uh, the the data sources had been one of the major issues what people had been scrambling with them in certain ways and interoperability had been an issue, how to relate one with the other, getting on, on them. So there's national sources of data, civil registration or the national identity cards and others and many other national existing sources had been used in that way. So how do you look at it in the future, th developing this kind of capacities which may support the national systems to support the data need in the future. Please. Thank you, and uh, it really is an honor to be here with these very eminent panelists and to learn about so much progress in Bangladesh in uh, generating and using data for decision making during COVID. Um, but as you mentioned, I'm going to talk about a very old source of data, uh, the civil registration system which in principle registers every birth and registers every death. 
uh, and yet doesn't seem to um, be fully uh, effective in, for example, Bangladesh and many other countries. And thinking back to uh, the early months of 2020, when did we really get frightened about COVID? When did the fear come in at the government level? It was when we saw these huge increases in deaths in countries that were continuously counting the numbers of deaths. Sudden, you know, 30% increase in the number of deaths in a developed country like Switzerland within a matter of 10 to 15 days. It was really shocking, really frightening. But we had those data. We sit here in Switzerland, and in Switzerland, every death is registered within days of occurrence, and it's counted within a week in the national statistical system. And it was that fear, I think, that led governments to say, this is incredibly serious. This is not just people getting sick. We are losing um, very productive people in our populations. Now, Bangladesh has been working for some time to strengthen its civil registration system. But it's a challenge because um, most deaths occur at home. They don't occur in the hospitals. The hospitals are a very good source of data, but most deaths don't happen there. So how can we capture these deaths? Is, and the, the deaths at home are essentially the most vulnerable populations. They're the poor. They're people who are um, not necessarily included in services. They're uh, marginalized often, people without fixed addresses, homeless, um, refugees, displaced persons. So how can these be captured? And um, within Vital Strategies, which is uh, an organization I work with, we uh, started to look at what kind of um, interventions could we take to uh, identify deaths in the community. And the, the major source of information was actually all these community-based health workers. Uh, Bangladesh has a huge number of people based in the community, um, lady health visitors, the people who provide uh, family planning support, for example. They provide mother and child uh, care interventions. And they uh, know their communities really well. They know when a death has happened. Uh, so we had to find some way of ensuring that that information was captured in the national system so that we don't only count the deaths that occur in hospitals, but also count those that occur in the community. Now, strengthening uh, this civil registration system is not a simple matter because um, Bangladesh is a very big country. There are you know, 900,000 deaths that occur every year. Counting 900,000 deaths is, is a major undertaking. So, um, but we have to start small. And we started in, in certain, uh, with collaboration with, um, with Bangladesh authorities, started in certain regions and tried to make this system of uh, counting deaths work. It's called rapid mortality surveillance. The idea is to identify deaths within a few months, uh, a few d days rather, of their occurrence report them to this civil registration system, and then start to count those deaths and see, you know, are we seeing excess mortality here, or are things actually okay? And when we see excess mortality, then we know we need to go in there. And um, the vaccination, of course, is highly, um, uh, you know, highly effective mechanism for preventing excess mortality. And interestingly, the vaccines were developed precisely to prevent deaths, not to prevent infections necessarily, but to prevent deaths, because it's the deaths that led to the major lockdowns, the huge economic problems for communities. People were unable to go to work, to earn their livings, and so on. So uh, really, uh, how can we improve these civil registration systems? I think we have to learn from this experience with COVID. It starts with the community. We need to have mechanisms at the community level to count those deaths and then integrate them into the national statistical system. Um, Ms. Carlo, if you allow me, just for this uh, civil registration system in the, in the context of the pandemic we see on the death issues in particular, it's a multi-stakeholder approach, obviously. What role do you see for the local government in these cases? Because it's a communist approach in many ways. So those countries which have relatively weaker local government or devolution of power, and how do they really link up with this, uh, the national processes or the national statistical system? 
Well, the local government is actually th the most important in many ways because it's closest to the local communities. But they need to work with partners, and a key partner is the health sector. Um, and precisely because of this whole uh, community-based approach to delivering healthcare services. So that's a very important partnership. The other partnership is at the national level. It's at this, the level of the National Statistics Office. Uh, and, and that's you know, many miles away from where these events happen. Yep. But we need to ensure that that uh, Statistics Office is there to analyze the data, to look at the patterns, um, to investigate which parts of the country are most affected um, and, uh, you know, how to start yeah. to address that. I so I think those three partners plus civil society. We have to engage much more effectively with civil society. It's not something that bureaucracies generally do very well, but um, that's where we, we can really build the capacity to identify these terms. No, 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 very, thank you for those points. Uh, I think this l links in very well with the issue of localization, which has been mentioned earlier by uh, Alex, and also uh, by Dr. Flora in terms of the new policies which we are talking about, whether they should find. And this is the missing link between the local government and the national statistical agencies at this moment. And thank you for highlighting all those things. Uh, I have one of my colleagues, uh, panelist, uh, fellow panelists, waiting very patiently out there, uh, Dr. Pramod Mah uh, Varma. He, he is, had been the chief architect of the Indian Digital Identity Program. Adhar, he is uh, the chief technical officer of STEP Foundation. Uh, he, he is a computer scientist. In such, uh, that's a very refreshing, uh, I, think, I think, distraction from the uh, statisticians and the policy analysts over here. Um, where are you currently located, Dr. Verma? Bangalore? Bangalore, India. So from India joining us over here, Dr. Pramod Verma. Uh, the, the issue is that, you know, the, the, we have discussed the National Statistical Organization, innovative sources of data and others, and obviously the issue of private sector involvement will come up over here. And the big data issue is a big thing uh, in many ways. It has many dimensions. So what role do you see for the private sector in jumping into this bandwagon, they are already there, but what are some of the exp experience in this case? And I would also alert you to the fact that uh, one of the major discussion is, of course, is about data privacy and protection of data, and in this case, uh, sharing it with private sector entities in the era of Google, Facebook, and WhatsApp, what we really do about it. You have all the solutions, I understand. Please, <laughs> the floor is yours. I wish we had all the solutions, but I think uh, this is a constantly evolving uh, topic. But um, anyway, thank you for having me. Pleasure to be here. And uh, I know that I'm the only science, science, science uh, person in the panel. So. Would you kindly come closer to the microphone? We, I have a bit difficulty in listening. Yes. Is it possible? Are you OK? That's better. Better? Yes. OK, thank you. Yeah, so I, I just wanted to, before we uh, go down to the private sector ask, um, I just want to share a little bit of how we are thinking about it. Uh, because I think we, unless we think it systematically, we'll always be um, panicking and ad hoc mechanisms only work, right? Uh, so first of all, for um, one thing COVID has taught us, and definitely any other such large scale impact and future, nothing is stopping uh, such things to happen, is the um, recognition that the data is not just about health. Uh, data is about uh, harnessing the signals, signals from variety of systems beyond health, telco signals, uh, community signals, you know, uh, uh, Google search-like signals. Uh, many of the signals actually give you very interesting um, uh, mechanisms by for prediction. And that's very important for us to not talk about only health data. Uh, we are actually after a set of signals, not necessarily about specific data. That's important. Second point, we are looking at data into three categories. Uh, personal data, which is the first category, which is what you talked about privacy, uh, Dr. Patajarya, is where the data containing sensitive data, and hence privacy and security is at most important. Treatment of personal data has two parts, right? Protecting the data, 
wherever it's stored. But in India, we are also looking at empowering with that data because um, most Indians are asset light and the, their digital footprints is the only asset they carry. So and as we digitize the society fast, we believe empowering people with the personal data is key. And that's point number one. And category two is the other extreme, which is openly available public data. And that open data, while it has been talked about, it's not, I don't see many places that is well, um, especially in private sector, not implemented very well. And I think it is very, very important that open data that is publicly available, that are anonymized, typically anonymized aggregate data, uh, that is available from the ecosystem for transparency, for research, for prediction, for a variety of innovation. And that must be a community property, that must be a societal property, and that must be made available. And the third category is where the sensitivity lies with private sector. Private sector collects as we digitize many systems, private hospitals, private telco companies, private banks, private schools, collect a lot of the signal data as they digitize their system. But a lot of that data is also their intellectual property. So it's very tough for, them, for us to, from a government perspective, say you shall put all the data out in public. Uh, after, of course, after anonymization, but nevertheless, they would say that's my IP and I can't put everything out. So we have to be sensitive about how much of data, how much of that data can be converted to open data. So the real idea is to get the open data category rich and that's where the private sector can really play well. And what can they do? They must work with the regulator and the government to create standards for open data for ease of compliance so that they understand their IP rights, they understand their sensitivity, but they should still figure out a way in various domains, in healthcare, mobility, uh, education, telco, many other uh, data. How can we bring this minimalistic, anonymized, open data sets as a mechanism of a naturally automated compliance, not as an extract, and that's very, very important. They should also help design protocols for exchange because they're very good at it, they're practitioners. They can actually help government to exchange that. I think that's what is really important. I think India is looking at this enabling through policies and data infrastructure under National Digital Health Mission. And we are looking at going away from today's world of extracting the data, like the way we extract oil. It's so painful. We extract data when something goes wrong, but instead of that extraction and ad hoc data collection, we must move towards emit, a natural open yeah. data emit that happens from all private systems. Dr. A Verma, I will, ha I will have to interrupt a bit and uh, because I have to close no. the session soon. Mm -hmm. I have one question for you and uh, it, it is one issue which had been going around in this building during the last couple of days. The, wor the word is data trust. How do you really create more trust in that? So w what type of measures or self-regulatory measures you see on the part of the private sector in creating the data trust? I think that's what I, I was specifically talking about. They must create a set of minimal open data sets and they must come together in various domains to say, these are my standard open data sets that I will emit and donate back to the trust. And by doing that, not only we get resilience in the country, but I get a long-term simple compliance without someone asking me for data because that's a very bad way to extract data. So I think they should work together to create this data trust where the data is emitted and donated back to the trust, which is typically in anonymized aggregate fashion. But that signals coming through the trust is very key for the government to be able to create a resilient and predictable uh, standard mechanism to predict any trend whether the death trend or medicine trend or Google search trend, for example. We should be able to get that data. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Verma. I, I wish we had more time, and, uh, and, uh, but I, I'm sure there will be other opportunities in the future to discuss these issues further uh, along with this panel. I will open up the floor for one minute because of protocol purposes and also for substance. Anybody who wants to really jump in in 10 seconds and make a point and no, no, no questions over there. But I will first recognize those who are in the house. I have a couple of colleagues in the house. Uh, let me take 10, 15 seconds, two of you. Please, would you...
Sir, yes, I'm, I'm looking at you. Yes, sir. Yes, would you introduce yourself and make your point? And then I will go to the other person. We need a microphone over here, please. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Andrew Odero. I'm from the World Food Program based in Johannesburg. I really just want to congratulate all the panelists for the work that they have done during these trying times. And there is certainly a lot to learn from how you have uh, managed to bring these intelligence systems to work for uh, in, in, in uh, providing protective actions. I have two, two thoughts, one for, for Dr. Flora and uh, Dr. Chaudhry. Um, and, and don't expect to be responded to. You just make your thoughts known to yes, us, please. <laughs> yes. Um, uh, sh you talked about an important point of uh, learning by doing. Yep. How about doing by learning? Because it, that's a critical point that you need to move into now to, to appropriate and put all together so the what lessons is the second that you've learned. The, the second one is for Alexei from the Global Innovation Fund. How do we access the Global Info Innovation Fund? Thank you. I am also interested to know that. Thank you very much. How do you do that? Uh, uh, a colleague over there somewhere. Yes, please, microphone. I'm sorry for making you run so fast. <laughs> and that would be the second and last Thank intervention. Thank you. Uh, my yeah. name, uh, I'm from Poland. My name is Ursula, Ursula Marklewicz. Uh, I, uh, I would like to say, uh, to tell that, uh, uh, that the panel was very important, but, uh, but I would like to, uh, to add uh, something new to that. Uh, from my uh, own work, uh, so, so namely research, because uh, in, the, in all discussion on the data, uh, I think it, uh, it is neglected role of human knowledge and research. Research. We have uh, so many research done before uh, by uh, in, the, in producing like Maslow, uh, Kotler, Klein, and Rosenberg, yeah, and we don't use that. It is very important. We don't use also knowledge on uh, the, the, and research on ourselves, on our existence. And I did a model. I I, I integrated the research through uh, through uh, the 20 years. And I, I, I integrated at first uh, functioning of, uh, of enterprises, of enterprises, and then uh, and, uh, and, uh, and precisely actual function, functioning okay. and, and expressed uh, as model, as operational model, with aligning four years ago also Thank environment you. and uh, 2030 you. agenda with SDGs. So Thank you. Give so thank you very much. I thank think you. We're, thank you very much for underscoring the role of research and the research as one of the, those who will be using the data, who would be also assessing the quality of it and also, also feeding in, in, into the process with new data as well. Colleagues, thank you very much. I've, ten seconds each. Let me start over there. <laughs> thank you. Well, uh, you know, Bangladesh, I, I think, is always a, a really good example of a country that. Um, doesn't wait for the demand for data to supply it. It goes straight forward and says, let's make the most of what the data that we have. Yeah. And that increases demand for better data. So it's okay. a, a really good virtual Thank cycle. Thank you for uh, underlining the need for demand to be more explicit and expressed. Thank you very much. Please. Yes, I also want to add my congratulations to Bangladesh for their experience and learning for all of us. And I look forward to seeing how we can build on this success in thinking about other public health challenges, in, such as tuberculosis and other uh, things, and you know, really building on this and learning by doing and doing by learning. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Uh, actually, um, as uh, she and himself also mentioned, about the learning by doing and doing by learning, but probably that would be the best approach at, at this point in time. At the, at the same time, uh, you know, we need to look for the evidences and use the evidences for our policy and health practice purposes. Thank you. And to develop a resilient health system. Excellent, excellent. Dr. Pramod Verma, your last thoughts, or parting thoughts, rather. Yeah, thank you. I, I think data must be brought out as public good. 
and government must enable that policy and private sector must support that policy to bring data as public good and that is the only way to create sustainable and resilient great as great society. thank you very much anit chaudhary two things i think several of the panelists talked about this it's the focus on experimentation i think that the only way to, to learn is to experiment so incentivizing and supporting experiments and collaborative experiments that's one another is that pramod talked about is open data creating public good where private sector also donates data so figuring out a framework it won't happen automatically we have to develop a collaborative framework for that so public private and academic data collaborative guys that would bring in research as well thank you very much and uh, on that um, uh, dear participants uh, and all the colleagues who had been joining us today morning in bern and also from all over the world as you have seen we had a fantastic panel which has deliberated on one of the most important issue of the current you know data discourse that is how do you use data for decision making how do you e interpret this data for further uh, public policy uh, in interventions uh, we had with us today dr alex peterson zwani we had with us dr mirza de sabrina flora we had with us uh, ms clara abuzar and dr pramod verma and we were kicked off by anir chaudhry uh, from ay bangladesh uh, so i couldn't have thought of a better pan set of panelists over here let me thank you all gratefully for these fantastic inputs which you have given for further thoughts um, sitting over here i i wish we, we could run it for another one hour and bring in all your expertise much more uh, on board but there will be hopefully other occasions on that my three takeaway i have my grandmother's rule which says never do more make more than three conclusions anyway the fourth one will not be remembered by the, even by the most important intelligent people so what are the three takeaways for me my first and foremost takeaway is that uh, we need to really further our data initiatives from this uh, pre pandemic to pandemic to post pandemic phase so that would be one of the major area how do you really bring the data innovation into decision making in the recovery and uh, and and dealing with the new normals as we proceed the second area is that we will have to go beyond health so whilst we integrate all these data issues within the health system we will definitely have to go beyond strengthening the national health system to other areas to link up with other socio economic indicators and also the ecological and environmental indicators governance indicators gender uh, indicators and others as we know so going beyond the health system and going out there and the third and Uh, and possibly one of the most important one is how to strengthen the national uh, statistical system with further partnership with the non-state actors the C cbos and ngos and also the private sector along with that both within the government and also across the border as we go both internationally and nationally building those new partnerships and experimenting and learning by doing and creating more innovation more space and possibly more welfare for the left behind people thank you very much that was a very very enriching i think lesson for me and hopefully for you as well keep well see you soon bye